Mikhail Hausman plays Alex Sokolov in The Flight Attendant on HBO Max, and I'm Riley Chow. Now, Alex mostly exists within the Mind Palace, mm -hmm. uh, this kind of dream construct. The producers, you know, obviously debated extensively about coming up with the rules. Uh, I'm yeah. wondering, what are the rules of the Mind Palace? Um, so, yeah, oh, what a great place to start. I think one of the exciting things about the show is that they set rules, like perimeters, um, and then over the course of the season, they abandon those rules. So they constantly surprise Cassie um, as, as, as her mind is sort of spiraling out of control and hopefully the audience. But so um, I guess in, in the first episodes, the rule is that um, it's sort of like, uh, I, I'm always in the room where the big trauma happened I'm always in the, in the hotel room and um, I am, I sort of, by dying, I also, you know, I'm not resurrected as like a zombie or a ghost or something. I am really a figment of her imagination. Or that's the way I saw it at least. So um, what was interesting about that is that she, she only knew me for one night, you know, and we had a great night. I'm obviously on my best behavior because, um, you know, we're on a date. And so w when, when I'm back in what, what the, what, what the, uh, what the creators called the mind palace indeed, um, I am this version of Alex that is not, necessarily who Alex was. Um, for me, that meant that I sort of thought of two versions of this character. You know, there's, there's Alex that we see in the opening of episode one, and then there's the character that she sort of conjures up. You know what I mean? Um, and then when it, to go back to your question about the rules, I think at first the rule is I'm in the room, I'm in her head, and I don't know anything that she doesn't know. And then over the, over the course of time, it's like she can't contain me anymore. And at some point, I don't know what episode it was off the top of my head, but she, um, uh, she gets so frustrated with constantly being back in her head with uh, with Alex that she leaves the room and that's new in her mind. She's never been able to do that. And then she thinks, okay, great. I'm safe here. And then I leave the room as well. Um, and it culminates, I think in, in the episode where everything sort of comes together for her and she has to face some of the demons that have been haunting her and that she's been running away from. And I'm not only in the room anymore, but I'm, all around her in like, um, for example, the AA meeting um, and ultimately I am back in her memories uh, where, she's, uh, where, where she's witnessing what happened to her um, in, a, in a terrible car crash where she uh, lost her dad. Long story short, there's a rule that is somehow, you know, they, they, they're confident enough that they felt like, okay, this is the rule and now we're gonna abandon it. Yeah, would you say that created like a third version of the character for you to play? Um, yeah, or maybe uh, that third character is like, as, as he discovers, you know, he's also sort of egging um, Cassie on to discover more about what happened and about what uh, Alex's past or life looked like because he's curious, he wants to know. And so as she's unraveling more of the backstory, I guess he comes, he gets closer to the real Alex, to the guy because he starts to put things together and figure out, okay, so this was what my life looked like. Looked like. 
And the sad part of the story is that it almost becomes a love story between the two of them that will never be because now he's sort of getting to rediscover himself and he's definitely falling for this fearless woman. But, you know, that will also, once she basically faces her, her fears, that will be the end of him. I always thought it was going to be a bit of a challenge to make a comedy that dealt with such dark, dark subjects. But that was also one of the reasons that I was eager to be part of it. Uh, yeah, they said that when they cast you, uh, you were actually the fastest one for them to cast. Um, they all got on board with the idea. They said they liked your air of mystery when I was talking to the uh, casting directors. But they said that any hesitation came from kind of not really articulating the scale of the role um, about how you die in the first episode and then kind of conveying to you or other actors how you would actually figure into the full season. Uh, can you talk about why that's a hesitation? Um, well, I'm, I'm trying to think of what, what, whether my hesitation was the, the size of the role. Um, but the size of a role can be a hesitation, of course, because you're committing to uh, making in this case 10 episodes, it will be, uh, you know, a, 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 a quite considerable amount of time in which you're not doing anything else. Um, so you really have to feel like you can sink your teeth in a character. Um, and then COVID hit and we actually, <laughs> it took us a year to shoot this, <laughs> it took even longer. Uh, but, but let's, let's just ignore that because we all know that that happened. Um, I think for me personally, the story was just when they, you know, I first read first two, the first two episodes and, uh, or maybe the, only the first, because that was probably the one that was, that was ready uh, at the time. And I just thought, you know, I die in episode one. How, how, how am I going to come back? How is this going to be a character with an arc and, and, um, and just being on the, my first call with, with the creators, like imagine being on a conference call and Steve Jockey trying to pitch the Mind Palace. It was just really a complicated plot to me. Um, but I, I, I obviously in the end thought, okay, don't completely understand what we're gonna do, but it sounds pretty cool. I like the idea of the Mind Palace. I like how sort of weird it is. And, and I, don't, I don't think I really have a point of reference for a, a comedy that's doing this. You know, think about the huge bunnies or the, you know, when she's going through, uh, she's on a bender and then we're in the Mind Palace and there's a huge sort of like sculpture made out of vodka bottles. You know, it's just, I like the um, I, I, I like how how sort of different that was, and I like that idea. Now, of course, I also really liked the 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 idea of doing something that is more in the world of comedy, because I I don't I've never really done that. So, what do you think you learned about playing comedy? Say my lines faster. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I learned a lot, but 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 uh, I think one one of the things that they were just pushing me for those first couple of weeks or episodes, maybe, is to just keep the pace up, you know, because this is the kind of show that wants that. Um, it's something that Kaylee is really good at, you know. Uh, keep that energy energy in there and push the plot and keep it going. Um, that's something I really had to, that was a challenge for me. I wanna jump back to some of the other roles uh, in your career while I have you. Um, you know, people have obviously seen you on Game of Thrones and The Flight Attendant and uh, Haunting of Hill House. 
Uh, but I would say your breakthrough in American television and film was actually on for May, where you were there for all four seasons as a main cast member. Uh, can you talk about what that experience meant to you? Mm. Um, well, it's Treme is still one of those projects that I hold very probably dearest because it um, first of all it was the first my first show in the United States after I mean I, I grew up in the Netherlands which is where I'm from originally and um, and I moved to the United States in 2009 which is the year we started shooting Treme I moved for Treme and um, it was probably it felt a bit serendipitous I I grew up as a teenager, I had one album, a CD that I had found by sheer coincidence. And I just thought the cover looked cool and I did not know what it was. And this was called, the album was called The Very Best of The Meters. And it was on the cover, it had the band just hanging out and they looked so cool. And I just thought, okay, this is probably something I would like. And I listened to that, that album probably my entire high school, every morning that was what I woke up with. And it is it's it is a quintessential New Orleans funk band. If I am allowed to take one album or one CD with me to a deserted island, I would take that album. Um, it, is, it is, for me, this is the highest form of rhythm and blues and funk. So, I always thought one day I'm going to go to New Orleans to um, get a sense of what that city is like. Little did I know that I was going to live in New Orleans and not only just, you know, spend some time in the city, but through the show, I felt like I got, you know, I got to see some, some parts of the city that, that otherwise would have always been hidden for me you know, parts of the culture, because that really was what the show was about. I, I love being part of that show. And I, uh, I've never had that experience that we had making that show where on like, I think it was on Sunday night when they would air it, um, people would go to bars to watch it. And so sometimes my wife and I would go to uh, sit in the back of a bar and see how people respond to uh, to what 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 happened, you know, it was very cool to make a show about New Orleans and watch it in in a bar in New Orleans. And then finally, uh, that show ended in 2013, and then in early 2014, we saw you on uh, Game of Thrones, Nashville, and Orphan Black recurring all at the same time, essentially. Yeah, uh, I wonder if this goes back to um, you know, talking about being kind of tied down to a show, if the casting directors for those shows were just all waiting for you to finish Treme. Um, yeah, like, how did you get on all those at the same time and kind of springboard the rest of your American career? Um, I think what really happened was Nashville came first after Treme, which was very interesting because it was like Treme, it was a very music central, music focused uh, show, but very different, obviously. And then probably um, Orphan Black came in and because of the commitments to both shows, I was able to do both. And then when I was offered um, a role on HBO, uh, on, on Game of Thrones back for HBO again, like Treme, I had to stop the other stuff. So uh, that is why my, my characters on those shows ended on, on both Nashville and Orphan Black. I, I, I don't quite remember how we ended it, but we probably said, okay, let's do one or two more episodes and, we can, and you can write my character out in a, in, a, in a way you see fit. But the shows came out at the same time. So it felt like I was doing three or two uh, shows that were all sort of like getting a lot of attention at the same time. It was, uh, 
Yeah, it was funny. It was weird. It was not planned, you know. Mikhail, well, uh, thanks very much for chatting with Gold Derby today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in season two of The Flight Attendant, if you're there. Uh, and then also, you know, what you're shooting in Atlanta now. Riley, thanks so much. I, I, I enjoyed the chat.